Hello, everybody. Namaste. This is Mohini Srishti from Evolve Beings. Welcome to Sexual Education Summit. And today we have our dearest Dr. Gail Dines from United States of America. Welcome, Dr. Gail Dines, and thank you for joining us. Really a heartful welcome to you. Thank you for inviting me. It's a pleasure. Yes, Dr. Gail Dines has been working over two decades in bringing the awareness around the harms of porn and bringing more awareness also to the parents that what kind of damage it has been doing to our youth and children and teens and tweens because porn in today's time is unavoidable. And, and this is one of the very important topic to our sexual education summit that we wanted to bring. And Dr. Gail Dines has an age old experience and she has been a porn activist and bringing a lot of movement in, these, in this awareness. And that's why we invited Dr. Gail Dines to this summit to bring a lot of important insights on this particular issue. She is a, she is a professor emerald in uh, Wheelock College for sociology. And, uh, and she, she is the president and founder of Culture Reframed, which is a nonprofit organization working towards, they have a lot of educational programs to, for the parents of teens and tweens for, uh, for, educating, for educating them towards the harms of the porn and, uh, and the solutions. So welcome everybody for joining us. And uh, Dr. Gail, would you like to start and let us see? Thank yeah, you for that know. lovely introduction. And it's a pleasure to be here. And I'm going to share my screen. Um, so what I'm going to talk about today is actually growing up in a porn culture, the harms and the solutions. And we're going to talk about the way in which this is actually a public health crisis. And in fact, what I'm going to show is it's a stealth health, public health crisis. That is, it's kind of in plain sight but very few people who are tasked with taking care of kids and youth really understand this. Who really understands that we're living in a um, sort of public health crisis of pornography is actually the media. So this is Details magazine, which is kind of like cosmopolitan for men. And they had an article a few years ago called How Internet Porn is Changing Teen Sex. And they interview Joanna Angel, who often refers to herself as a feminist pornographer. And I would argue that you can either be a feminist or a pornographer. You can't be both. You have to choose which one. So, but she did say something very interesting. She said, the girls these days, they just seem to come to the set porn ready. So I want to talk about what this means to be porn ready. Because not every girl is going to end up when she grows up, or even if she doesn't grow up because they use girls on porn sets, um, they're not gonna end up on porn sets, but that doesn't mean to say that they're not being socialized to see themselves in a pornified way. So how is this happening? Well, I wanna talk about the world that young people, especially young women at this moment are growing up in. And I wanna quote something from a very famous um, media theorist called Neil Postman. And he talked about how we've shifted from a print-based culture, which if those of us over the age of 35, 40, grew up in a print-based culture, to what is now an image-based culture. That means the dominant form of communication is the image. Now, Neil Postman says something very interesting. He said, as a society, we developed some immunization to the seduction of eloquence of the printed word. We have not developed any immunization to the seduction of eloquence of the image. And one reason for that is because images work at different parts of the brain and activate different parts of the brain than print. And I want to say one thing that's really bizarre about an image is even when an image lies, it tells the truth because you can't help but believe that which is in front of you. That's who we are as human beings, to believe our eyes. So I wanna talk about what it means to grow up in this hyper-sexualized culture that girls grow up in and have to navigate what it means to be female in a culture surrounded by images like this. Now, importantly, these images that you see in mainstream media are very much white, thin, 
blonde and hypersexualized. There's kind of, for all the millions of images that exist out there in pop culture, you can really distill it down to these kind of images. And especially the hypersexualization, the pornification of these images in mainstream media. And we do have some women of color, but they have to look like Beyonce or Cardi B. And I want to bring out something here that's important about this, is when they show women of color, they often show them either painted as animals or animal prints. And this is a long held trope, especially in the United States, that legitimized the wholesale rape of African-American women during slavery is to suggest that somehow they have this animalistic sexuality. So this is a racist trope that has a long and ugly history in this country. Also saying with Rihanna, notice the animal print. So I want to talk about how images work. And in media theory, we talk about visual grammar. So when you look at this, I want you to take a close look at her and think about her clothes, and most importantly, who she's looking at, her gaze, G-A-Z-E. Because we talk in media theory about the fact that, women, that all images have a reader inscribed in the text. That means they're speaking to someone. So who is she speaking to? Well, she's obviously not speaking to her mother, saying, let's have a cup of coffee after the photo shoot. She's speaking to men. And what is she saying? Well, I can sum it up in two words. She's saying, fuck me. This is the fuck me look. Come get me. I'm sexually vulnerable. Now, what was interesting in my classes on media theory, I would say to my female students, can you do the fuck me look? And they would all immediately know exactly how to go into this look. And then what would happen when I would say to the men in the class, can you do this look? And they would be completely mystified of how to do it. And we would actually, the brave, some brave male students would come up to the front of the class and we would literally shout instructions at them at how to do the fuck me look. And you know, they were awkward and didn't know. And so you'd, I'd have two women and two men at the front of the class doing the fuck me look. And the women would look perfectly normalized in this culture. The men would look ridiculous. Now the question is, why is it ridiculous for men to take the fuck me look, but perfectly normal for women to? And the answer to that really lies in the gender system that we have created. What makes women hot in this culture is sexual vulnerability. Come get me. What makes men hot is not sexual vulnerability, which is why the fuck me look doesn't work for them. In fact, in fact what makes men hot is not fuck me, it's actually fuck you. It's that really aggressive stance. This is why feminists argue that rape is built into our gender system. And that in fact, men who rape are not sexual deviants. They are in fact over conformists to patriarchal norms. All they are doing when they rape is actually taking on all the ideologies, norms, cultures, and values of a patriarchal culture. And in fact, as a sociologist, my interest is not so much in men who rape, because that makes sense in this culture. My interest is in men who don't rape. What are the protective factors that have prevented them from internalizing all the norms and values of the patriarchal culture and that they choose not to be rapists? That is a really interesting area of study. Now, what do we know about girls who hypersexualize themselves? The American Psychological Association um, a number of years ago did a report and what they found is that girls who self-objectify, and this is a whole new thing now, you're not just being objectified by the culture, you are internalizing it to the point that you self-objectify. The more a girl self-objectifies, the more likely she is to have anxiety, depression, body loathing, risky sexual behavior, early pregnancy, suicidal ideation, self-harming, etc. So we know it is not good for girls to see themselves as disposable sex objects. Yet this culture says again and again and again, this is who you are. This is what is on offer. And I really want to talk about the impact of what this means and, and who taught me the most. And it was not someone with a PhD in sociology, women's studies, or media studies. It was actually an incarcerated rapist. And he was in prison for raping his um, stepdaughter. And he was talking about how he groomed his stepdaughter. And then he said something that forever changed the way I think. He said to me, the culture did a lot of the grooming for me. And 
basically I almost fell off my chair because I thought that's exactly right. This is the piece I have been missing. That it used to be you needed individual pedophiles to groom individual girls. What you have now is a much more economical form of grooming. What you have is a mass grooming pop culture, grooming en masse our girls to see themselves as either fuckable or invisible. That's the choices on offer for our girls today. Fuckability versus invisibility. And when I go out to schools and colleges and I lecture on this, what's really interesting is many women come up to me afterwards and girls and they say to me, you know what? I chose invisibility and I'm miserable. I've got no friends, I don't go out, but I just can't be fuckable. And then what happens is the young women come up to me and say, I chose fuckability and I'm miserable and I hate it, but I don't want to be alone. So really, this is no choice. When you have two choices between fuckability and invisibility, neither one is a choice. You are actually being forced into or being groomed into a way of life by the culture. So when we talk about female empowerment or female sexual agency, we have to understand that in a porn culture, this is an empirical question because it doesn't come naturally, empowerment or agency because you are being groomed from the moment you are born to see yourself in a pornified way so this is the choices they have this is what girls have and i can tell you from my work with girls and from me um lecturing they're not happy with this they feel like they're drowning in this porn culture and when i often say to them has any adult ever helped you negotiate this new world of a pornified culture they all shake their head and they say the same thing we're drowning and we don't know what to do so this is the position now our girls are in. Now, let's talk about our boys and how internet porn is changing teen sex for our boys. This is the same story from um, Details Magazine. And what they said is there's a generation of young people who think sex ends with a money shot to the face. Now, a money shot is ejaculation on the face. And this is what we know is happening widespread. And let me tell you, when I was growing up, if a guy would have said, can I come on your face? We would have thought, oh my God, let's get the hell out of here. Something's not right. This has now become normalized. And what's interesting in the studies is that when men are asked, what is the one sex act you've not yet done, but would really like to do? Come on your face is number one. Now, the problem with our culture is we have what is called a parent naivete gap. So you have young people growing up in a porn culture, but what studies show is that 50% of parents almost underestimate how much porn their kids have watched and really don't know the kind of sex acts that their kids are watching. So here you have the perfect storm of a pornified culture, porn being the major form of sex education for kids today, especially boys, and parents who are the main protective factors who are the ones who are absolutely most important in bringing up healthy children into healthy adults do not know what is going on. And I can say that personally, because when I go and lecture, I, parents are absolutely shocked by what I do. But I also need to say that when I lecture to pediatricians, when I lecture to teachers, when I lecture to sex educators, no matter who I lecture to, they really do not know what is going on in the world of young people. And I spent a lot of time interviewing young people, speaking to young people, and it is a world out there that is, a, they are an experimental generation. We have never brought up kids before with absolute access to hardcore pornography. So let's look at this pornography. So the gold standard study is Anna Bridges and her team in a peer reviewed study found that at least in 304 most watched scenes, 90% contain some form of violence against women. Now, let me tell you what the content of mainstream pornography is. Now, this is mainstream. This is what you get to for free in, I don't know, I get to it in 15 seconds, so I imagine the average boy gets to it in five. So these are the, whatever you look at on Pornhub, and I'm gonna talk about Pornhub in a minute because that's the most traveled porn site in the world. The scenes, whatever category you look on, you will see the same thing. Gagging, where she's gagged with a penis so far down her throat that she's choking. The tears are streaming down her face and she can't breathe. And as she's gagging, the man pulls his head closer to his penis so she gags even more. 
Now that is to be separated from another thing that is increasing today, which is strangulation, which is hands around the throat. This has now become much more common. We're also seeing this being used as a defense in rape cases when he kills her and he says she wanted rough sex and he strangled her. Now what's important to know about strangulation that makes it so dangerous is that when you are strangled, what happens is that it can take up to a week for the effects to show because the throat can take a week to swell up. So you can go to sleep one night feeling fine, a week after you were strangled, um, during sex and actually die. So we know this happens. We also know from studies that battered women who are strangled as they're being battered are much more likely to die at the hands of their batterers. The other um, acts in pornography are rough anal sex where she's been pounded. And one of the problems with women in the porn industry is they only last three months because their bodies cannot simply endure this violence. And so what happens is often their anuses literally drop out of the body and have to be sewn up again. Ejaculation on face, as I just mentioned. ATM, which stands for ass to mouth. This is where the penis goes into her anus and then directly into her mouth without washing. This has become a very popular um, act on Pornhub. Hair pulling, spitting in a face. So it is not uncommon to go to any porn site, any porn video on most of the free porn sites, and you will see all of these going on at once. You'll see one woman and she will be um, penetrated orally, anally, vaginally by three men. She'll be having her hair pulled, they'll be spitting in her face, calling her a bitch, a whore, a cunt, and then the end is they ejaculate all over her face. And she is just look like she's been run over by a truck. I want to give you an example of one website, gogglemycock.com. And I mean, they don't hide what they do. We fuck them in the face till they cry. And let me tell you, cry they do, because these women are not the best actresses. They're often poor women. They're women doing this to put food on the table for their children. They're women who are being pimped into the porn industry. I myself have seen this when I went to the uh, porn expo in Las Vegas. I was watching pimps do negotiation with the pornographers, with the women behind them, negotiating how much they could get for pimping their um, women into pornography. So let me explain. When I was looking at all this porn and I was writing Pornland, which is my book Pornland, How Porn Has Hijacked Our Sexuality, I was like just immersed in pornography and it got to the point where I could barely stand to look at it and I was kind of looking at it like this and I thought, what if my 11 year old son had gotten to this when he was that age? He would not be the man he is today. And how would he have stood this? That was the question that was coming out over and over and over again. How do they stand it? So I started, this was a question because really what keeps them on the site? And then I started reading the text that goes with these images. So I want to give you an example. This is from Gag Me and Then Fuck Me. Do you know what we say to things like romance and foreplay? We say fuck off. We take gorgeous young bitches and do what every man would really like to do. We make them gag, we give them a sticky back, etc. Look how clever this is. So the first age of viewing pornography is around a weapon. So this boy, and actually anecdotally we find it's earlier, around eight or nine, this boy has got no sexual history, no sexual repertoire, has not had any sex ed, not any sex ed that's worth anything. And then he gets to this that says, we take gorgeous young bitches and do what every man would really like to do. You know what? That's not true. Every man does not want to do this. I know many men who would not do this, but how is he at 11 years old going to engage with this? How is he going to say, no, that's not me. I don't want this. They are telling him, this is your rite of passage into manhood. Another example. So in anal sex, the um, key issue here is that they really hurt the woman. So I want to give you the promotional copy from a film called Anally Ripped Whores. We at Pure Filth know exactly what you want. Acts, chicks being ass fucked till their sphincters are pink, puffy and totally blown out. Adult diapers just might be in store for these whores when their work is done. Now again, look how clever. We at Pure Filth know exactly what you want. No, they don't. That 11 year old boy, when he puts boobies into Google or gets to porn through Snapchat or Instagram, which I'll talk about a bit later, he's not looking for this. 
He thinks he's going to be lucky if he sees a pair of breasts. He thinks he might get lucky if he sees a naked woman or people having sex. He does not expect for one minute to be catapulted into this world of sexual violence and torture. So now I want you to think of that 11 year old boy who has got a toxic stew in his stomach of arousal, shame, fear, self-loathing, and he's got nobody to talk about it. I would argue that he is being traumatized by these images. And what we know about trauma is that if you do not deal with the trauma, if you do not reconcile the trauma, what do you do? You habitually repeat the trauma by going back to this place where it happened in the hope that there will be a different outcome. So if he is traumatized by pornography, what's he gonna do? He's gonna keep going back to the pornography again and again and again. So what you're doing here is you're building in trauma as part of the business model of pornography as a way to get boys habitually using porn. Now, how did we get here? How did we get to this place from Playboy Penthouse Hustler, which was bad enough, but I'm often nostalgic for those days when I see what is mainstream today. So we need to understand the pornography, pornography as an industry. And what the internet did in, the two, in 2000 when it became domesticated is it made pornography more affordable, more accessible and more anonymous. The three major drivers of demand. What we know is that the pornography, whichever methodology you use, is about a third of internet searches, internet traffic, internet sites. So it has really cannibalized the internet. Porn sites get more visitors each month than Netflix, Amazon, and Twitter combined. This is not a small industry. Now, this is an interesting quote from a pornographer. He said, a lot of people get distracted from the business model by the sex. It, pornography, is just as sophisticated and multi-layered as any other marketplace. We operate just like any Fortune 500 company. I would actually add to this that they're more sophisticated than most Fortune 500 companies. It is one of the most sophisticated developed businesses we have. And people forget, pornography doesn't drop from the sky. It is produced within an industrial setting. Porn businesses, like all businesses, raise capital, undergo mergers and acquisitions, organize trade shows, and most importantly, most importantly, they interface with banks, credit card companies, venture capitalists. You see, people say to me, if you do anything about pornography, won't it push it underground? And you know what? That's exactly where you want it to be. Because when it becomes above ground, it gets knitted into global capitalism. Every single major organization, from credit cards to banks to venture capitalists, have a vested interest in the continuation of the porn industry because they make money from it. This is the worst case scenario, is that pornography is knitted into mainstream capital. Now, what Adult Video News, which is one of the porn business sites, said is that the corporatization, which is really monopolization of porn, isn't something that is happen going to happen. It's happened. So we now have consolidation of the porn industry. It used to be a mom and pop industry in 2000. All that changed around 2007 with a company that was then called Manwin, but is now called MindGeek. MindGeek is the Amazon of the porn industry. It controls the vast majority of the porn that is distributed across the world. It owns 10 of the most 15 lucrative porn sites in the world, most of the free porn sites. And this is just Mindy giving you an example of all of its networks. And on the left, you see what it owns. On the next one with Brazzers and Babes, these are production companies. Then at the Wicked and lesbian, lesbian Porn and Playboy, these are what they actually distribute. They say that anyone in the porn industry is no more than two degrees of separation away from MindGeek. MindGeek is the bully on the block, and most of you out there have probably never heard of it, which is astounding because this runs the porn industry. Now, most importantly, they control Pornhub, which is the most trafficked porn site in the world. Just to give you an example of the size, Pornhub is in the top most popular websites in the world. And I want to thank Leela Micklewaite from Exodus Cry for sharing these slides with me. The ones with red on there are the ones that Leila shared with me. 
Now, Pornhub statistics in 2019, 42 billion visits, up from 33 billion in 2018. Daily average of 100 million visitors, 962 searches per second, uploaded 4.79 million new videos on top of the millions already there, and created over a million hours of new content. There is never enough porn, and if you live to be 200, you won't get through a fraction of what is on Pornhub, but yet they keep create, distributing and creating more. Pornhub boasts that 100 million daily visits is as if the combined populations of Canada, Poland, Netherlands, and Australia visited Pornhub every day. Now, this is Pornhub Network, and this is, I want you to just take a look at all the organizations that they network with, because they, for example, kink.com, which is a torture porn website, Hustler, so they are in um, sort of webs of networks, which is why Pornhub has so much power. It doesn't, MindGeek doesn't just own Pornhub, it also connects with all of these. Now, what does partner network mean? It means cross links. So when you get into Pornhub, other things start popping up, other websites, and you end up down a rabbit hole, often one you can't get out of. It's shared micro payments. So when you go into Pornhub and you click on something else, they share the payments with them. Cross platform advertising and shared content. So you need to think of the porn industry as a web with MindGeek at the center. And by the way, if you go on MindGeek website, you will not see the word porn anywhere. They define themselves as leaders in search engine optimization, as in internet um, technology. They do not mention the word porn anywhere. Now I wanna talk a little bit about Pornhub traffic during the pandemic. In March, you saw an increase from 120 million visitors daily to 134. The reason for this is that more men are at home all day, and secondly, Pornhub made its premium content free in March. That was their contribution to the pandemic. What does this mean? So Pornhub, most of it is free. But in this case, what you have also a premium, which is the more sort of sophisticated, um, the technology is better, and you have to pay whatever, $16 a month or something for the premium. So Pornhub being the great um, philanthropist and charity that it is, decided to make the premium free in March when lockdown began. What we saw in Italy is that increased visits to Pornhub by 57%, in France by 38%, and in Spain by 61%. We also saw in the United States an increase of 40.3% around 3 a.m. And the reason for this is that people were going to bed later and we need to say not people, but men. Pornhub said people, but it's men. And a lot of them were waiting for their families to go to sleep so they could go on Pornhub Premium. So now imagine this, you're locked in a house with a man who is now using more and more pornography than ever before. Is it a surprise that calls to domestic violence shelters, that cases of battery went through the roof and are still going through the roof during the pandemic? Now, this is only one variable and one factor, but there's no question in my mind, given research, that the increased level of use of pornography, Pornhub, the violent mainstream porn, played a role in this. Now, I want to talk about cross-platform marketing to kids, because this is crucial. And what really allowed for the cross-marketing and what really facilitated kids getting into porn was the cell phone. Parents were just getting used to thinking how to develop tools to monitor the um, laptops or computers and now the um, phone came around and what we find is that parents have lost control. Now the main um, social media sites for kids are Instagram and Snapchat. Here are some stats on Instagram, 800 million total of, daily, of monthly users, 40 billion photos uploaded to date. How can you possibly monitor that much content, 40 million photos? 20% is the number of all internet users who use Instagram. 68% of Instagram users is female. Stats on Snapchat, 210 million daily active users. 69% of 13 to 17 year olds use Snapchat. And 3.5 billion snaps sent per day. This is where kids are today. They're not on Facebook. Why? Because we, the parents, are on Facebook. They've gone to Snapchat, Instagram, and increasingly TikTok. 
Now, the main thing on Snapchat and Instagram are selfies, right? Taking a picture of yourself. Does anyone out there remember when you used to take pictures of other people in the old days? Just think how crazy this is, constantly taking pictures of yourself. 74% of Snapchat photos are selfies. A thousand selfies posted on Instagram every second. 93 million selfies taken each day. We are creating a generation of especially girls who are kind of voyeurs. There's never a good enough selfie. You can always improve it. That's what my students told me. So they become obsessed with the body to a level that I don't think any other generation have ever become obsessed. And of course, the queen of Snapchat and selfies is one of the Kardashians, the youngest Kardashian. And again, this idea that you are so focused on your phone and getting the likes to make sure that you look your hottest, your most pornophile. And I want us to think about what this is doing to our girls. Now, how do kids get to porn on Snapchat and Instagram? So this is, Inst uh, this is Instagram and the porn performers who are very popular, like Sunny Leone, has 11.7 .7 million followers. You go onto her, Snap, her Instagram account and you can go from her Instagram account right to Pornhub within about 10 seconds. This is how the kids are getting to pornography. Now, Snapchat is even better for kids. There is a thing, when we did interviews, we asked kids, how are you getting your pornography? And this to mention something I'd never heard of, Snapchat Premium. So on Snapchat Premium, you have the porn performers be having their Snapchat Premium set up by companies like Fan Centro. So you have a whole set of companies, another web of companies in the porn industry setting up porn sites for porn performers on Snapchat behind the premium firewall. And what happens is these companies like Fan Centro say to the porn performers, when you set up your sites, if they put, if Snapchat finds the pornography and takes you down, we will get your sites back up running within 24 hours so you don't lose any fans. So again, we have a very sophisticated business model and the kids go from Snapchat premium again, right through to Pornhub. So these are becoming the major deliverers of porn to kids. Also, we know that kids hide their porn behind emojis. This is how you find and hide um, oral sex because you lick a lollipop. This stands in for breasts or buttocks. This stands in what well, you can imagine. And anything with teardrops in an emoji is ejaculation. So parents do not get that their kids are often writing these emojis and thinks they're just fun where actually they're writing messages about pornography or they're hiding their pornography behind emojis or they're searching for their pornography on Snapchat, Instagram, and elsewhere through emojis. So Instagram, Snapchat, and other apps are gateway to porn industry sites by normalizing porn. So what do we know about the impact of porn on boys and men? We know that for the teenage brain, it is developing at a level that it is not developed since it was two years old. The preteen and teen brain is actually hardwired for um, for risk taking and for novelty. So this is the perfect storm of the brain hardwired for risk and novelty taking, the hormones are raging, interest in sex, no sex education and free porn. Where are they going to go? The porn industry knows that kids are absolutely the prime consumers because if you get them young, you've got them for life. Now we have Peer-reviewed research over 40 years. These are just some examples of what are called meta-analyses. When people say there is no research on the fact that porn is harmful to kids and indeed to adult men as well as women, they, they either don't know the research or they are willfully lying because we know that there is so much research out there. Now, sometimes they'll pick somewhat of a rogue study, a junk science, a lot like... Um, uh, climate change deniers where you know the weight of the science is clearly going towards climate change but you'll find some study somewhere buried somewhere that says no and then all the climate change deniers pull up that study that's the same with those who argue there's no harms in pornography they'll find some study somewhere that's hardly quoted and goes against the weight of the rest of the evidence now over 40 years what do we know are the effects on boys they have limited capacity for intimacy 
they're more likely to use coercive tactics, more likely to rape, sexual harassment, more likely to have increased depression, more likely to be addicted. And increasingly what we're finding from the neuroscience literature is they're having erectile dysfunction due to the use of pornography. This is all peer reviewed research that over 40 years have coalesced into the impact on boys. To the future. Well, one of the problems is, as Jules Jordan said in 2003, is that fans want an extreme, more extreme porn. And to be honest with you, there is very little more extreme they can do to women other than kill her on the porn set. So now we have another type of porn that is growing in, popu in popularity. Thanks to the Ashcroft versus Free Speech Coalition in 2002, thanks to that decision, and the Free Speech Coalition is actually the lobbying arm of the porn industry, they struck down two provisions. And the most important thing they struck down is they said you cannot use girls under 18. That was the 1996 thing. Now they kept that, but what they struck down was that you cannot use girls who look under 18. The Free Speech Coalition said that was too limiting for their free speech rights. The Ashcroft Court agreed. So now you can use women who look under 18. And overnight, we got an explosion of what they call teen porn sites, where they look very young. Notice the Disney imagery in the back. Notice how young she looks. Notice her hair is done like a kid. First time with daddy. This is thanks to the Ashcroft versus Supreme Court decision, legal now, as long as she's 18. And we don't know if she's 18. There's a whole series called It's OK, She's My Stepdaughter. Now, what do we know about this? Now, this is having enormous effects, not just on men who are classed as pedophiles. But now we have found there is a new group of men and clinical experience and research evidence are now accumulating to suggest that the Internet is not simply drawing attention to those with existing pedophilic interests, but is contributing to the crystallization of those interests in people, I would say men, with no explicit sexual interest in children. In other words, men who are not pedophiles are developing a sexual interest in child pornography or child sexual abuse images, and a certain percentage of those are going on to rape children. This is what this study found. And I myself knew this because those men I interviewed in Connecticut State Prison all were in for downloading child porn and raping a child and not one of them was a pedophile. They all preferred sex with adult women. And when I said to them, then why did you rape a child? You know what they said to me? We got bored. We got bored with the usual pornography <coughs> and we wanted to try child pornography. And then we wanted to try a child but not one of them had touched a kid till their thirties. Pedophiles start offending around 13, 14, 15. These men all said to me, if you would have told me two years ago that I would be in prison for raping a child and for child pornography, I would have said never, I'm not going there. They themselves were shocked to be there. So what do we do? We've developed this toxic culture. How are we gonna change it? We change it any way we can. And at Culture Reframed, we have what is called the um, multiple strategy, the, um, where you tie this monster, the Gulliver strategy, you tie it down piece by piece, whatever way you can. At Culture Reframed, we have decided to go the public health route. We develop programs for parents, we educate. And at this point, Samantha Wexler is gonna come in and explain the world, the life world, the work that we do at Culture Reframed. She's going to explain our programs and she's going to introduce you to the solutions that we have developed because we can fight this. We don't have to give in to the porn industry. We do not have to allow the porn industry to hijack our youth. And in fact, I would argue that as adults, it is incumbent upon us to stand up for children and youth's rights and to say to the porn industry, you are not going to steal our kids from us. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, thank you so much, Dr. Gail. I'm just a bit speechless and very overwhelmed seeing your presentation. It gave me goosebumps and also, yeah, tears in my heart and yeah. Thank you, because we don't know so many. Yeah. So it's, it's very hard to watch this. I'm, 
I appreciate. I'm just going to turn you up because you've gone quiet again. So just let me turn you. Oh. Um, I understand that you know this is this is the response I get often. Yes. Is um, I can't tell you how many times um, you know after I've done this, especially women are in tears, mothers, yeah. because they're thinking of their children. And one of the reasons we started Culture Reframed is that I was going around lecturing, and I have been for twenty years, and you know. And I would see, and whether women were, and if I was lecturing to pediatricians or social workers, when they came in at nine o'clock for the lecture, by 9.15, they were all parents. Forget being a pediatrician. So, you, you know, because when you have kids, the kids are the foremost on your mind. And I remember one particular lecture I gave in a very well-known children's hospital here. And I looked out and there were pediatricians and nurses, but really by the end of the lecture, they were parents. And they looked just devastated, devastated. And I thought to myself, I can't do this. I can't go out and drop this on them and walk away and do nothing. I just can't do this anymore. It was really ripping my soul to pieces to leave people in this state. So that's why we started Culture Reframed. We have solutions, we have programs that Sam is, you know, I'm sure discussing, and to say hope is out there, but we need to start a movement. It is can't be parent, just parent by parent. We have to have a movement to fight for our kids' rights, to have a full life-loving sexuality based on intimacy, connection, love, all the things that make life worth living, not pornography. Yes, exactly. Thank you. Thank you so much. I have no words and I'm so grateful that we came across your TEDx video, um, you know, on this subject. And I was immediately like, let's send you an invitation and, well, and try if you can. Yes. Yes. Come on board because as much light and as much message we can bring, you know, on this subject, it is just going to open eyes of people because Maybe because the women, maybe at times, or people, most of the people also, they don't know so much about how it is harming, you know, on a bigger level and bigger scale, what is the kind of the whole net which has been fished exactly. around. Yeah, like what you told in your presentation about the Instagram and, uh, you know, all these young Snapchat and social, TikTok yeah, social now, media. Yes. Yes, yes, how easy it is for the kids to, even if they don't want, they just get some alerts and they are on that form site without even realizing that they didn't want to go on that. Exactly. So, exactly. yes, yes. And I'm, I'm so glad that you asked me to speak in a conference on sex ed because, you know, in my experience, um, and I've spoken at many conferences on sex education and spoken to many teachers, they teach sex ed as if pornography doesn't exist. And you can't do that because you cannot teach, you cannot bring kids, and first of all, in most places they don't teach sex ed, and when they do, it's not very good. But the most important thing is you cannot teach sex ed to kids whose sexual template is already formed by pornography. What you have to do is unpack with the kids what they've learned from pornography to start building a new type of sex ed. But to not mention pornography or to do it in passing and then think you're going to have some impact on these kids while meanwhile they're stuck in a pornographic mindset is ridiculous. That's not how pedagogy works. So what I would implore everybody who's watching this is that, you know, and I want to say at Culture Reframe, we are developing some modules for sex ed teachers, which puts pornography front and center. It's kind of a critical porn analysis to say that you cannot talk about sex ed without first talking about pornography with the kids. We're not suggesting you show the kids pornography, but you have discussions about what they've learned so that they can begin to reflect on what they've learned, understand the way their sexual template, their sexuality, their gender identity has been formed by it, so that we can move away from that towards a more life-loving sexuality. Our kids deserve that. Our kids, everybody deserves that. But if we cannot hand another generation over to the porn industry, we've handed one over, enough, enough. We have to stop. Yeah, yeah. Can you hear me now? Is it better for you? I'm, am I audible? It's still a bit low, but I'm managing, yeah. Yeah, okay. <laughs> because I'm just wondering, the audience would also struggle to hear me. So no, just, uh, Yeah, they can turn it up, yeah. Yeah, okay. And... Um, Sorry, I had a question, but I forgot. But um, yeah, the first time I saw porn and 
I remember my reaction. It was like, if this is sex, I don't want to do sex. You mm. know, it was so aggressive and it was so much from the space of aggression and no intimacy and nothing. And I think this is most of the reaction for maybe many women or even men um, at times when they see pornography and they wonder that if this is what is sex and, you know, this is what we had been curious mm. for and it just leaves them disappointed. And, yeah, but there's uh, a bit of a difference between boys and girls. You see, what we know from studies when girls go on, and increasingly girls are looking at porn, but they're looking at it as a form of sex. They're not, they masturbate much less to it than men do, than boys. So they're just seeing what the guys are looking at so they can perform those sex acts on them. What we know is that boys do masturbate. So what's happening is although they might be sickened by it and, and feel like, you know, you did, I don't want it they're aroused and they're masturbating and they're ejaculating. So you're actually cementing those images with the full body force of ejaculation. So it's different for boys. Yes, yes, I agree with you. Do you think that this presentation, because many parents when we have been right now promoting uh, also on this subject, they have been asking us, can they watch it with the children? So can they watch this presentation? No. no. Yeah. No. Okay. Yeah. You this should not watch this with the children. No. What you what when Sam Samantha Wexler, our executive director, talks about our programs, there are sections in our programs that you certainly can watch with children. With your, um, we would say your tweens from nine to thirteen. There's one program, and there's another program that's for teens. There are sections in our program and culturally framed. All the all the programs are free, by the way, and online, so anyone can get to them. Um, and then what we suggest is you go through the programs first and then you find the modules and then you can discuss that with kids. There's, there's embedded videos, there's discussions, there's conversations, there's even scripted out conversations as Sam will discuss. But there's a lot of stuff on culture reframed. This is for the parents, not for so, kids. Culture so reframed is for, the, is for parents to use with kids as well. It's for the parents. Yes, I saw your website and uh, for parents to know that all the programs, all the online programs on Culture Reframe site, it is free means it is, yeah, for you to refer as a resource yes. for how to be educated and how to educate and, you know, tell your children. And we have Samantha, uh, you know, who's going to give the presentation on the solutions. We had to run, we have to make this as a pre-recording with Dr. Gail because she has her son wedding on the same days when it's the summit is happening. So this is a pre-recording what you are watching, but just immediately after this uh, session, please uh, go back to the access link and you can connect with Samantha's live, wherein she would be running us through the solutions uh, of the porn industry or of the pornography in children. So, and wherein you can also ask your questions, if any, with Samantha, who is the executive director of Culture Reframed. And uh, I still have a few more questions. Maybe quickly I can put it across to you, Dr. Gail, that what do you think can lay a good sexual uh, foundation for our children? Well, I, I would like to see what they're doing more in England, although the studies are showing it's not doing such a great job, but at least they've conceptualized it well, which I, I wouldn't call it sex education. I would call it sex and relationship education. I think we don't want to, sex is part of being human. And so I think um, a sex education needs to be put within a holistic person. It's not just about an orgasm, genitals or what have you. Because you know, sex is about so much more than sex. It is a way to communicate. It is a way to be vulnerable with somebody. It is a way to love somebody. Um, and you can have fun sex as well. There's nothing wrong with fun sex as well. But in so many ways, what you learn in sex are such good lessons to take with you, how to be trusting, how to be kind, how to be intimate, how to be connected, all of these things. And this is what I fear we're losing all over the world is that level of being. And, and I think, you know, and, you know, when you have some connected, intimate sex, all those skills you learn, you take into the world as a human being. And it, it changes who you are and as it should, and it should change it for the better. It shouldn't make you want violence and abuse and all of those things that porn does. So I would say a good sex education certainly focuses on sex and what sex is and connection, but 
absolutely as well and this is something that much sex education doesn't do you have to center female pleasure right women you know women don't know about you know studies show in you know hook up sex where you just meet someone have sex and off you go don't know their names in many some cases 89 percent of women during hook up sex do not have orgasms you don't even get the most basic thing from it, which is an orgasm. Why are you doing it? So um, I think we need to center female pleasure. And what's interesting, the studies show, is that when girls learn they have a right to sexual pleasure, they're much more able to say no. And consent becomes more meaningful because if they don't enjoy it, they say no. But we don't teach them that girls have a right to sexual pleasure. We don't teach about girls' bodies. They don't know what the clitoris is in many cases. I mean, I, you know, a funny story. I was at a conference and there was 500 people there. And I gave my talk and then a very well-known biologist gave her talk. And it was about the clitoris. And they didn't want her to show a slide of the clitoris. And I've been showing pornography. And I said, this is ridiculous that you can't show a slide of the clitoris. They said, no, a drawing. So, okay, they showed a drawing. So after I finished this biologist is speaking and people behind are holding up the picture of the clitoris and the speaker happens to turn around and burst out laughing. For 15 minutes, they'd been holding the clitoris upside down, the picture, and nobody even knew. I mean, if you held a penis upside down, everybody would be able to tell you it's upside down, right? So, I mean, girls need to know about their bodies as well and the wonderfulness of their bodies and the pleasure that their bodies give them. And, you know, they don't, they need to know about masturbation. They need to know about finding their own sexual pleasure. They need to know what they like, what they don't like. And the most important thing is they need a voice to say those things. They need the confidence and the voice and the sense of liberation to say what they want. And that's not just around sex, that's actually about everything. Yes, yes. Thank you for bringing all these points because when you say that 89% of women does not even have orgasm in hookup sex, in India probably the statistic says that 30 to 40% women maybe does not even know what orgasm is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I have spoken to many of my friends who are married with two children and it's the same. They don't know what clitoris is. They don't know what orgasm is. And I, I know, was, I know. Can I you imagine really... spending your life not having orgasms? I mean, who, who, you know, and, and then what are you? You become, in a way, if you're not having sexual pleasure, you become nothing more than a masturbation tool for the person you're with. It's, it's just, uh, it's sad that, you know, in our, uh, we have been saying that sex is not just about release and reproduction which in today's time we have you know pretty much made sex only about release getting rid of you know the sperms or the liquids or fluids and all about the production having babies you know so yeah. it's not just about this it's much more and as you said it's holistic and this is what through the sex education summit being a sacred sexuality expert myself and being a tantra teacher myself this is what is the light we want to bring through this summit that sex is a prayer sex is meditation sex is sex is a sex is liberation it is a source of transformation yes. it's 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 not just even about even orgasm and pressure it's much more it's much yeah holistic and uh, everything means so yeah thank you so much it's about much. being human it's about being human yeah it's just yeah. it's just about it's just about accepting our own natural self yeah so yes yeah the opposite of pornography yeah yeah so uh you think in u.s there is no sex education in schools as well Well, sam's going to address that um okay. and talk about but it's not very good. i mean in many schools there's not and what is is not good no no, we are, and we are worse than most European countries here. Okay. So, um, so kids, I mean, most kids all over the world that are using porn as their major form of sex ed, even when there's sex ed in the schools. What, what do you think could be the alternate resources for kids to learn about sexual education? Well, Sam will discuss some of those because there are some really good um, sex education uh, um, I know that the Unitarian Church has got a very good curriculum. Um, so there are some very good sex ed curriculums, but again, none of them really focus on unpacking what they've learned from porn 
before they get to the sex ed. So um, this is why we found it so important to start, you know, to um, get consultants who are, you know, sex educators to write actual um, modules about how you teach sex ed with porn at the centre. So that porn is no longer at the centre. You know, in a way it's ironic. You put porn at the centre of a healthy sex ed, so it's not at the centre of their lives. Yes, you need to rewire. That's what we say that because you have been so far, the sex agenda or the focus has been just to release and get rid of this energy in some ways and or either very aggressive. So it needs to rewire what you have learned. And it takes time. It takes a lot of willingness to, to, to make this change in your own life. To but play. The good news, yes. oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt Yes, you. please, please. Okay, the good news is when you look at the research on the brain, the brain has the most incredible capacity to reboot itself. So you can learn. Nothing is once a done for all. Those who are listening to this and have had a problematic use with porn, or even looked, even looking at porn once actually can reshape your neurons and the way you think. Um, the thing about it is, is that you can change. That's what we know from all the research is that even you know whatever you've been using whether it's whatever if it's heroin pornography or whatever you can reboot your brain the beauty of the human body is incredible that you can build new neuro neuro pathways new ways of thinking being in the world it's never too late yes and uh, as we are in COVID 19 time it is the best time to reset reboot us and you know rebirth to, so to yes to rebirth into something new, which uh, make us feel more connected to our own self, to our own, you know, spirit and to our own core. And uh, Absolutely. yes, Absolutely. yes, yes. We think who we are. Yes, yes. Thank you so much, Dr. Gail. You're very for, welcome. And again, thank you for asking me. Yes, for giving us this time, really. Please accept my heartiest thanks to you. And uh, uh, dear audience, please don't, go away you just have to go back on the access link and join samantha the executive director of culture reframed to listen on the solutions of pornography parents tune in with us and uh, see you with samantha thank you gail thank you so much thank you. you're thank welcome you, you're welcome yes.